come along with us to see some of the most monumental treasures in the world. Pisa, a Renaissance city in western Tuscany, located at the mouth of the river Arno, and where historic monuments acknowledge the glory of this former maritime power. A place of remarkable monuments that also contains the artistic treasures of various Italian cities. Both spiritual and worldly treasures are in total harmony. The Piazza de Miracoli, the Square of Miracles, encircles the majestic Leaning Tower. Built at the turn of the first millennium, its name is well deserved. The imposing marble facade of the cathedral, the impressive dome of the baptisterium, and the Camposanto cemetery with its commanding simplicity astound visitors by their magic. The cathedral and campanile were built on sand. During its construction, builders tried to prevent it from tilting, but for some time were forced to stop. A hundred years later, they dared to start again. In those days, the grandeur of the buildings was due to the liberal-mindedness of those in power. The interior of the cathedral gives an overwhelming impression with its mixture of early Christianity, Byzantine and Islamic styles, which belong to Italy's early monuments. Many a spoken wish or secretly prayed for request has resonated around the beautifully created ceiling of this place of worship. In mysterious semi-darkness, the paintings and sculptures of important artists show the strength of belief of past eras. Sunlight shines through the lead-framed glass of church windows and gives both altars and alcoves an air of mystery. This building also demonstrates the wealth of Pisa and its rulers. The works of various sculptors and painters to be found in the finely engraved pulpit and numerous exposed frescoes are a memorable experience. The smell of incense seems to pour out of its venerable walls and invites those who come here to seek refuge from the outside world. It was here that Galileo Galilei discovered the principle of isochronism with the aid of a lamp that hung down from his ceiling. Hardly surprising that the harmonious beauty of various statues of the Madonna and shrine relics invite a natural or inspired silence. The Baptisterium, dedicated to John the Baptist, was adapted from the Baptist Church in Jerusalem, and with its pumpkin-shaped dome, it is a monumental relic. A reminder of the long relationship between church and country, between secular and religious rule. The portal leading to the cathedral is decorated with the Madonna and Child. Numerous artistic stone ornaments decorate the external facade and indicate the Arabic influences of the architecture. The details are plain and simple. Made of burnt clay, the dome induces self-reflection and inner peace.
The cool walls of this holy sanctuary exude a calm that can subdue the mightiest of men and humble them in the face and glory of God. Here, Nicola Pisano created the first freestanding pulpit. It is possibly the most beautiful artificial masterpiece of Roman times. In the inner courtyard of the Camposanto Cemetery, there is a reverential silence. Here, instinctive respect calls for solemn calm. Exposed wall frescoes tell of the transient nature of secular power. Restoration is a constant task. Subdued light penetrates the cemetery from the delicate filigree of the Gothic arcades. Since they were first built, these venerable buildings have lost nothing of their overwhelming effect. Fortunately, these fascinating frescoes, the triumph of death, that date back to the 14th and 15th centuries, have been well preserved right up to the present day. From the Baptisterium, the place of baptism, to the place of burial of Camposanto, the circle of life is depicted, and marble headstones decorated with the insignias of those laid to rest here adorn the final resting place of numerous religious dignitaries. Beyond its famous square, the city's winding lanes are always fascinating to explore. Through the shady streets of the old town, the light stone facade of Santa Maria della Spina shines out in all its glory. It contains a thorn from Christ's crown. In contrast to this magnificent sacred display, the Palazzo de Cavalieri, it captivates through its massive size and decorative splendor. A double open staircase leads up to its elevated entrance. Decorated with various images and several heraldic figures, the facade highlights the power of the Florentine monarchy that ruled here until the Union of Italy. Order of knights dedicated to St. Stephen and the busts of various rulers and commanders once protected this city against the onslaught of the pagan Saracens. Pisa is an artistic masterpiece, a pearl of Tuscany. Several historic places of interest and ancient buildings, such as the impressive Tour Hassan, are to be found in Rabat, the capital of Morocco. The entrance gates to this area are protected by proud horse guards in traditional uniform. Their sharp pointed lances symbolize the historic military power of the former leaders of the Almohad dynasty. The largest mosque in North Africa was built here. Today, the vast marble floor and the bases of several pillars indicate the huge dimensions of the unfinished mosque. The 
mausoleum is a successful synthesis of traditional artistic craftsmanship and modern architecture. The Neo-Moorish monument took nine years to build. A Vietnamese architect designed this magnificent mausoleum. Beautifully ornate cedar wood and gilded ceilings decorate the impressive royal tomb. Dainty stucco ornaments and wonderful majolica walls cover the square inner sanctum, creating a dignified and solemn atmosphere. From the top of the surrounding gallery is a view of the sarcophagus of Muhammad V. It was cut from a single piece of white onyx. In 1956, Muhammad V led Morocco to its independence. The 44 meter high Tour Hassan can be seen from a distance. It was originally planned that the minaret would be 60 meters tall in order that it should rise above the entire city. The building of the tower and the Grand Mosque were commissioned at the end of the 12th century by the king of the Almohades, Yaqub El Mansur. Both the Tour Hassan, as well as North Africa's largest proposed mosque, were never fully completed. After the death of Yaqub El Mansur, this ambitious project was discarded and the buildings slowly fell into decay. Of the former 400 pillars that originally formed the prayer hall, only a few remain. Today, the surrounding grounds of the mausoleum contain the new treasures of this modern yet traditional country. Richly decorated buildings reflect the fascinating and highly developed skills of Moroccan craftsmanship. Next to the mausoleum, there is a mosque and a library. The reawakening of Moorish architecture is evident in these magnificent interior rooms and iron gates. The dead son of Muhammad V, the former King Hassan II, found peace on this historic ground. He passed away in 1999. The rich decorations on this monumental site are most interesting. Even today, although poorly preserved, the huge dimensions and pure beauty of the Grand Mosque are plain to see. In addition to having been subjected to pillage over the centuries, a powerful earthquake destroyed the remainder of the buildings. Extremely impressive are the many magnificent examples of Moroccan culture that were added later and now adorn the monumental tomb. Lamps and lanterns proudly indicate Moorish influences and the light of day highlights their unique beauty. A masculine symbol of Rabat, the Tour Hassan stands proudly above the ruins of the unfinished mosque. Together with the royal mausoleum, the area around the minaret unites both past and present. This building is rightly referred to as one of the three pillars of the Almohades realm. In the East Asian landscape of Myanmar, formerly Burma, is a proud and historic landmark.
After a fascinating hour-long boat trip on the country's largest river, the Ayawadi, we arrive at Mingun. This friendly and hospitable village is well known by both foreign and native visitors. Typical bullock carts are perfect for a journey into this region's past. Most of the buildings in Mingun date back to the ambitious plans of King Bodopaya. His ideas began to blossom in the 18th century. Bodopaya was convinced that he was an exemplary Hindu Buddhist sovereign. Thus he did not permit any criticism of his numerous architectural ideas. An example of his great love of architecture is the elegant and totally white statue of the Setaya Pagoda that was built in 1811. Close to the river, the temple is only a short distance from the building that encapsulated all of King Bodapaya's ambitions. It is a mighty though unfinished building called the Mingun Pagoda. Countless workers were employed to build the 72 meter wide and 50 meter high building. And even larger dimensions were in the original plans. With a planned height of 152 meters, the Mingun Pagoda was meant to outdo the highest stupa in Thailand at 127 meters. Bodapaya moved his residence to an island on the Ayawadi River. From there he could observe the work on this amazing building. Yet no one experienced the completion of this mammoth project. In 1819 the king died and further building of the pagoda was cut short. As soon as the visitor has overcome the steep steps, the beautiful view across the river landscape of the Ayawari more than compensates for the difficult ascent. In the background are the gentle northern hills and valleys of Sagaing that have a good covering of aromatic trees. From around 50 meters up, there's a splendid view. Shining bright white and magnificent, the Sinbayumi Pagoda rises up in the northern part of Mingun. The temple was built by a grandchild of Bodapayas in 1816. Three years prior to his reign, the king dedicated this sacred building to his favorite and highly religious wife, Sinbayumi, who was deceased. At the beginning of the 19th century, during the reign of King Bagidor, the building style that was commonly known as symbolic temple architecture was repeated throughout the country.
The outstanding architecture of the pagoda is closely associated with Hindu Buddhistic cosmology and therefore with Mount Meru, the center of the world. Like the monumental stonework of the great Mantara Ghi pagoda, in 1838 the temple was shaken by a devastating earthquake. Seven wave-shaped terraces symbolize the character of the mountains that surround Mount Meru and the Sulamani Palace that is located on its summit. In 1874, the damage to the Sinbayumi Pagoda was repaired by King Mindon, and today the settlement shines out in its age-old splendor. A number of small niches contain numerous Buddha figures, each one of which has its own religious significance. But their main duty is to protect the sanctuary. The pagoda is strictly arranged around the center of the settlement. Its architecture follows Hindu Buddhistic belief and this heart of the sacred Meru mountain is considered by believers to be the center of the universe. This important, legendary palace is inhabited by the Nat King, Tagyamin, who is also called Indra in Hinduism and Saka by Buddhists. The picturesque architecture of the temple highlights an abundance of religious mythology. However, Mingun is not only known for its impressive architecture, the village is home to the world's heaviest bell. The six-meter-high bell weighs more than 90 tons. The various styles of the buildings, temples, and indeed all these technical masterpieces transform a visit to this location on the banks of the Ayawari into a truly memorable experience. Finally, we pass by one of the most precious sites in Myanmar, the majestic ruins of Mingun. Mesquita Cathedral is one of the most important historical monuments in Cordoba, a beautiful city in southern Spain and former residence of the Moorish Caliphs. This was once their center of power. In 756 AD, Abderrahman I founded the Omeyyad Empire of Al-Andalus. Even today, the architectural and artistic influences of the Moors are still plain to see. Cordoba was at its zenith under the rule of the Caliphs. In 788 AD, under the rule of Abderrahman I, the construction of a mosque was begun. However, it was not completed until the reign of his son, Hikmah.
beautifully designed mosaics and wonderful reliefs adorn the mosquito. In the 9th century, Abderrahman II further extended the building. During this period of construction, much exquisite decoration was added. As time progressed, the enlargement of the mosque reached immense proportions and with great attention to detail. After the Christian army of the Holy King, Fernando III, conquered Cordoba, the era of the Islamic Mosquito came to an end. Thus ended the glorious years of the former powerful Caliph of Al-Andalus. The mosque was transformed into a church. Further alterations were undertaken from around 1384. Thus Cordoba's Mesquita Cathedral contains both Moorish and Christian architecture and is a unique and fascinating combination of styles. Due to its cathedral, the building has survived Cordoba's colorful history almost unscathed. However, oriental design dominates the building. The building complex that surrounds the courtyard and its orange trees is known as the Patio de los Naranjos and is one of the most beautiful Islamic buildings in the world. The present bell tower was part of a former minaret. The oldest tower was a model for numerous mosques at Andalusia. The immense prayer hall is the glorious focal point of the Mesquita. Its 856 columns and horseshoe arches create an oasis of stone. Cordoba Cathedral, that dates back to the 16th century, is located in the middle of a splendid forest of columns. Precious marble and paintings by Palomino decorate the main altar. Despite its priceless religious treasures, the cathedral has a strange, unsettling effect. Indeed, King Carl V thought the altar and choir area to be somewhat out of place. Approximately 300 years after the expulsion of the caliphs by the Christians, the cathedral within the mosque was meant to be a symbol of triumph.
The exquisite ornamental sculptures and beautifully decorated interior are symbols of the former wealth of Spain's Catholic kings. Construction of the new church began in 1523 and continued for around 250 years. This long period of construction gave rise to numerous building styles. The magnificence of the building is awe-inspiring. The cathedral was designed to outdo the beauty of the former mosque. Due to the creation of the cathedral, this outstanding sacred building has survived the rigors of time. And who knows whether the old mosque would have escaped the destructive power of the Spanish Inquisition. Today the former minaret of the Mesquita still rises up into the sky, proud and dignified, similar to the former Omayyad sovereigns of the Spanish Caliphate. The Moorish builders created a solid and enduring monument of their art, and one of Cordoba's most outstanding landmarks. Lying to the south of the Caribbean island of Cuba, Trinidad was founded by the Spaniard Velasquez as a third settlement. In the 18th century, and as an intermediate stop prior to the conquest of Mexico, the city experienced wealth and recognition through the cultivation of sugarcane. The exclusive palaces and villas of the sugar barons are still plain to see. Casa Ortiz lies directly on the Plaza Mayor, the center of Trinidad. Tall wooden gates, barred windows and original roof tiles characterize the style of bygone days. These treasures of the past are well looked after and on public view. Spanish conquerors left their traces here, just as did both Indian and African slaves. Here, creations of naive art mix with the influence of European art over many decades.
short but heavy tropical rain showers enchant the old town. Shimmering, damp, shiny stone facades and statues radiate an unavoidable, dreamy charm. The drumming of the rain adds to our impression of an alluring legacy of several decades. Even today, the glory of the past is everywhere. Tranquility and peace have not been invaded by modern life. Trinidad contains most of the country's museums. In the former residence of Sanchez Iznaga is the architectural museum with its eight exhibition rooms. The elegant colonial interior decor of this grand palace-type villa indicates how these properties were furnished at a time of great wealth. From the vast profits of sugarcane cultivation, the plantation owners built elegant buildings and had furniture and artefacts shipped in from Europe. Benefiting from the mild climate, lush vegetation spills across the courtyards of the villas with a green and tranquil beauty. The past remains intact as eventual economic decline appears to have frozen this place in time. Here, time stands both still and silent. The bumpy roads consist of cobblestones, which were specially imported from Boston. Centre of Trinidad, the furnishings of the main church represent the spirit of its people. Deep felt religious traditions are much cherished here. Each of the country's historic roads winds around the main square, the Plaza Mayor. The palace on the Plaza Mayor was built in 1740 by the Earl Nicola Brunet family, who lived there for several decades. Here, there is also a modern-looking kitchen with an amazing assortment of utensils. It's hard to believe that it's more than a hundred years old. Trinidad's most famous landmark can be seen from almost anywhere. The bell tower of Iglesia La Santisima. 
This is where the convent of St. Francis of Assisi was situated, which in 1929 gave way to a school. In the former palace of the sugar baron Cantero is the Museo di Historia. A feast to the eye, here visitors can marvel at porcelain, furniture from all over the world and valuable crystal chandeliers. still contain their original furnishings. This antique bed would fetch a high price in Europe. Wandering through these shady arcades, as once all the plantation owners did, is like being in another world. All the beauties of this exotic world gradually unfold. In the past 200 years, no Cuban city has changed as little as Trinidad. The Venice of the Far East. This is the affectionate description given to the historic old Chinese town of Lijian in the northwest province of Yunnan. Lijiang is also the center of the Naxi, a Tibetan Burmese tribe. They have a unique and highly impressive culture. Dayan, Lijiang's old town, contains an intriguing variety of canals and waterways. It developed at the beginning of the 12th century during the late Song epoch. Various streams and three rivers flow through the historic part of the town. Numerous beautiful stone bridges date back to the time of the Ming and Qing dynasties. The picturesque centre of the old town of Dayan is an architectural gem. Dayan's houses are traditionally built of brick, timber and roof bricks. The leisurely pace in the comfortable lanes of the old town is perfect for a relaxed stroll. Colourful pictures frequently greet the eye. To the visitor, the Dayan orphanage leaves a rather conflicting impression. Despite the smiling faces of these children, they face a future that is far from certain. Even today, domestic folklore and costumes are very important in this part of China the Naxi take a great pride in their cultural heritage. The Naxi were once a nomadic people, 
But many centuries ago, they replaced their tents with wooden cabins and settled in the valleys of Lijiang. They cultivated wheat and rice and became successful horse breeders. Today, the marketplace in Dayan has a convivial and pleasant ambience. The old town exudes a deep feeling of calm and contentment to both its visitors and inhabitants, assisted by the splendor of its fine architecture. While the Red Guards of the Revolution did their worst, Prime Minister Zhou Enlai Lijiang sent government forces to protect it. In the area that is known as Lion Hill in the southern part of the town, there is the beautiful and impressive entrance to the residential district of Mu. Due to its large dimensions, this area could be called a town within a town and it's surrounded by a variety of wonderful buildings. The noble pagoda roofs and the artistic designs and decorations on the buildings indicate the power of the Mu family's former tribal ruler. As in the old town of Dayan, this well-proportioned residence demonstrates the pursuit of harmony and tranquility throughout its architecture. For over 470 wonderful years of the Yuan, Ming and Qing dynasties, each of the Naxi rulers came from the Mu family. And for more than 22 generations, life in and around Lijiang was led by this family. Finally, in 1723, the Qing dynasty appointed a new government, so the Mu era came to an end. In Naxi culture, painting had much status attached to it. Colourful examples of this can not only be found here. As soon as night falls, the residence becomes an attractive setting for a performance of traditional customs. The Naxi writings, known as Dong Ba, that are a combination of illustrative and phonetic signs, are one of the few remaining pictorial texts in the world. Evocative traditional dance and musical performances in historic costume form part of the cultural presentations in the Mu residence.
In addition, those who come here can take full advantage of the great variety of regional cuisine that is on offer. Lijiang is the ancient cultural town of the Naxi and water wheels in the northern part of Lion Hill are a symbol of China's traditional water mills. This world contains numerous monumental treasures. Although many have already been revealed, how many more remain to be discovered? Today, it is the responsibility of UNESCO to protect these magnificent monuments. Thank you. 